Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Stephanie Pacheco. I manage outreach and arts education at the Hopkins Center for the Arts. And we are so thrilled to have Los Angeles Poverty Department here this week, um, along with Wonder Bomb, um, which is a Dutch theater collective, and they'll be performing Hospital, uh, their new play at the Hopkins Center on um, Friday and Saturday evening. And for those of you who come to HOP events, many of you know that artists and residents often do programs and events with the community and with students. Um, but we have very, very much been fortunate that our relationship with LAPD has been very rich and one of the most extensive over the course of the last year with support from the Dartmouth Center for Healthcare Delivery Science and Al Mully. Um, John Melpede and Henriette Brower from LAPD have been here several times in the last year doing research for this production and they've been meeting with healthcare policy researchers and organizers as well as students, faculty, folks at the med school, um, as well as community organizations here in the Upper Valley, including the Haven and the Good Neighbor Health Clinic. And we've learned about as much from them, I think, as they've learned from us. Um, in the words of Helen Damon Moore, whose class they visited last night, she said, um, Vermont rural poverty meets LA urban poverty with lots of similarities noted and interesting differences shared. So we wanted to take, an take this opportunity to share that conversation with you uh, through the perspectives of some community organizers, both from Skid Row as well as from here in the Upper Valley. Uh, I just want to thank the Rockefeller Center for collaborating with us on this event and piece of business that we are recording. So if, you know, when we come to the moment of conversation or questions, um, there will be microphones being passed along. So please speak into the mic so we have it um, on the record. I'm pleased to introduce our moderator for today. Sarah Kobolinski is a social worker and has been director of the Upper Valley Haven for about almost five years. Um, it's hard to imagine anyone doesn't know their work, um, but the Haven's contributions to our community can't be overstated. They provide temporary shelter and educational programming for homeless families and adults, as well as food and clothing to anyone in need. They're open 365 days a year. They do not charge for their services, and they serve over 10,000 people annually. In her role as director, Sarah has come to appreciate health and healthcare as having a huge impact on the lives of all people, regardless of social class or economic status. People in poverty, whether urban or rural, have extra challenges, so a connection with the vision and the work of LAPD seemed very logical to her, and she's been a great partner in everything we're doing this week. So thank you very much, and I will turn it over to Sarah, who will introduce the panel. Thank you, Stephanie. Actually, I'm not going to introduce the panel. They're going to introduce themselves. What we've agreed upon is a format um, for the time that we spend with you this afternoon is one in which uh, each of the folks to my left and right will talk with you a little bit about their work, their vision, um, what is um, on the top of their minds right now in terms <coughs> of health and health care. When they've finish that segment, we are going to invite you to join us in identifying some single words that, and from that list that we'll create together, we will ask the panelists to speak further, um, focusing on these subtopics that you will be helpful to us in identifying. Does that sound like a workable format? Yes. <coughs> All right. Then I'm going to start to my right with Kevin Michael Key, who is part of LAPD. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, said my name is Kevin Michael Key, and I'm with the LAPD. How about that? <laughs> um, I got to make a personal statement, first of all. You know, I'm an East Coast guy, New York City kid, and to um, end up in an Ivy League school, um, so I grew a gray beard just for this very moment. So I'm here at the panel with a gray beard in the Ivy Leagues. How about that? Um, I was educated in New York. Um, both I got a JD law degree and a PhD in streetology. I earned that in Harlem, you know. And, um, but it wasn't until coming 
to the streets of Skid Row that my life came full circle. I, I was trained to be a people's lawyer, but that other degree I had um, had me out there doing lots of unhealthy things to myself and to other people. And so I tell people all the time that Skid Row literally saved my life. Mm -hmm. and, and I become an advocate, a lawyer without a license for the community, for the people in where I live. And um, my work with LAPD is, is literally been life changing. Um, I work for a nonprofit in Skid Row. Our parent organization is Social Model Recovery Systems. And what I want to speak about is we've got a project that started in February 2013 called the Community Centered Emergency Room Project. And that came about because there were a large number of, and you know how organizations put these acronyms and letters, uh, NSA, Needs Special Assistance Patients at LA County General, which is about two, two and a half miles from my home of Skid Row. And what they found is that the hospital, because of its location, um, there were a large number of Skid Row community <coughs> residents, mainly homeless and some with mental health issues, who um, were utilizing the hospital for more than just medical treatment. You know, it was their living room, their bedroom, their bathroom, their kitchen. Um, and uh, although the hospital had um, security staff, um, you know, the people, it, being poor is a hard job and you have to have some survival skills. So they were getting through and around this and um, over utilizing the services of the hospital. So um, our organization was uh, contracted to try and help the hospital reduce the large number of NSAs, need special assistance people who frequently use the hospital for, and to, you know, they have health conditions, clearly, but also to the conditions that were arising from their homeless, their behavioral health, and the community conditions. Um, <coughs> so one of the things we did, we're social models, so you know, we're not about calling the gendarmes in to use the draconian practices that we've seen in other places in Skid Row. So we started doing some mapping to see what were the community assets, what were community liabilities, and how the community felt about the people. Um, so we did an extensive community needs assessment within the Boyle Heights and Lincoln, Boyle Heights and Lincoln Heights area surrounding um, LAUSC, that's the hospital. Um, we talked with the residents who were very concerned with the homeless in their community. Um, but they also expressed the need to develop opportunities to engage the homeless population and identify resources to address those needs. Um, in our work in Skid Row and in other communities, but primarily in Skid Row, uh, we do environmental prevention work and we found that it's instrumental to build relationships and partnerships. So we've done that in Skid Row, so we're taking that same learning curve and we're starting to build relationships between the hospital and the medical staff. And many of the medical staff, um, as caregivers, were enabling um, the homeless residents. We, we went in there the first time, they knew them by name, they knew their story, um, they knew the relationships that they had, they knew their drug of choice, a whole lot of things. Um, but we utilize their relationship and the relationships that we're building with the outside the community to uh, begin to try and address the needs both of the hospital and the needs of the patients. So we're trying to educate and empower both the community residents and the local organizations toward addressing the health disparities and also trying to find ways to reduce chronic diseases. And so we're looking to create this coalition. 
Um, and, you know, the different players have um, different outcomes they're looking for. Um, the hospital wants to um, try and do more outreach within the community because, generally speaking, county general hospitals in L.A. have all kinds of notorious um, nicknames that the local residents use for them. But they really have dedicated staff and, and very skillful people. So what my organization is trying to do is to find the balance to meet the needs of the neediest people in that community while at the same time helping the hospital to cope with what to them seems to be an, an overwhelming situation. Okay. Great beginning, thank you. And for a parallel but different story, I'm going to turn to my far left to Seal Furlong with Good Neighbor Health Clinic and have her introduce herself and tell you something about her work. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. No? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> so um, I thought I would um, start with the history of how the clinic got started because um, I never get tired of hearing that story over and over again. Um, so the seeds were planted in the late 1980s and an interfaith group was looking at homelessness in the Upper Valley. The question was asked, where do people get health care? I don't know, maybe some of you were part of the group, I don't know. Um, and they realized that there was no answer to that question. So people like Paul Manganello and Peter Mason and other um, members of the community found an answer by establishing the Good Neighbor Health Clinic, a free clinic for the uninsured and underinsured residents in the Upper Valley. The clinic opened the doors in 1992 at St. Paul's um, Rectory, which um, is right beside the Haven. And at that time, um, the Alice Peck Day Hospital paid um, the rent for us to be there, and Dartmouth Hitchcock Hospital paid the director's salary and donated equipment, furnishings, and supplies that were needed for a clinic. Good Neighbor could have never happened without the generosity and support of the community. Bob Keane, a dentist in the area, got the Red Logan Dental Clinic up and running in 1996 as part of the Good Neighbor Health Clinic. Red Logan, a beloved dentist in the area and volunteer, passed away and left money in support of the dental clinic. We quickly grew, outgrew the rectory and needed more space. A grant from the federal government and an anonymous donor provided funds for Good Neighbor and Red Logan Dental Clinic to remit to renovate the Gates Memorial Library. We moved into this very healing and beautiful space in 2002, and if you're ever in White River Junction, you should come see it, it's really amazing. Um, we have had more than 13,000 medical and dental visits at our clinics. Um, I do wanna also talk a little bit about our philosophy, philosophy of care. We meet patients on a person-to-person -person level and we create relationships with them. We focus on health and well-being. We practice medicine in its purest form. We don't have much computer data entry that we have to do. Um, our patients find help in human kindness here. We listen to them. We look at them. We touch them. And they tell us a lot of times that they haven't had that feeling at um, other places that they've gotten health care. Um, Good Neighbor has an open heart and respect for the people we see. We love the people who come to the clinic. We give <laughs> lots of hugs all day long, right, Stacy? Um, and now that's some kind of medicine, I believe. My doctor never hugged me. <laughs> <laughs> we experience our patients' gratitude. We marvel at how tenacious they are, often with several jobs, good families, strong values, and such a strong human spirit. I feel so fortunate to work with all the wonderful people who come through our doors, not only our patients, but all our amazing volunteers. We have over 150 volunteers that provide the care um, to these people that come to see us. We only have about a staff of seven, maybe, seven people 
um, and all the rest is um, volunteers. Something like 4,000 hours a, a year, I think, even. It's amazing. Um, <clears throat> a medical student named Sam gave me this visual in my mind of Good Neighbor Health Clinic. Good Neighbor Health Clinic can be thought of as a community tree which all the branches of important groups come together to create a meaningful health system and the result means the whole world to our patients who receive health care with a heart. Our care is compassionate, patient-centered, culturally centered, community-oriented. We are constantly remodeling our emphasis and services to meet the needs of the people we care for and with. The seeds were, as I said at the beginning, the seeds were planted in the late 80s and the tree grew tall. The roots are strong thanks to the founders who still volunteer today um, as well, and that's over 22 years ago. Um, my favorite, pa I like to end this with my favorite patient quote. A young woman called me after she had just gotten um, insurance and um, she wanted to thank us for the care that we gave her. And she said, I came to Good Neighbor and I was fed. I just think that's the nutshell. <laughs> thank you. Great. Thanks, Zeal. And now, John Melpe. So, um, okay, so I'm also, you know, with Kevin from uh, Los Angeles Poverty Department, and we, we both have in common, uh, we both have in common, lawyer, we're both lawyers without a license the other, at one point in our lives. The, the difference was Kevin went to law school and he actually had a license. And uh, me, I was, a, I was an artist living in New York when I got interested in, um, well, when I just suddenly discovered that there were lots of people living on the street, because, it, because up until like 1983, 84, there weren't a lot of people living on the street, right? It's, you know, because especially here at, at school, when everyone was born in, you know, whatever, the 90s now, um, you know, guess what? It, it seems like, yeah, well, that's just the way life is. But it wasn't the way life was. You know, that happened in 1983, and I was walking by a, um, I was walking by the men's shelter in New York on Bowery and Third, uh, which is now a, a fancy neighborhood where you can find, you know, Whole Foods and hotels you can't afford and all kinds of stuff like that. Um, but at that time, you know, it was, it was the Bowery. The Bowery was the Bowery. You know, now it's <laughs> now it's like you know, Bowery theme park or something like that. Because actually, I, one of the um, Actually, our, our pals who we're doing the show with, they went to New York, for the, the, the Dutch people, they went to the New York these last couple of days because there's a big uh, booking conference there. Stephanie was there also. And, um, and they, ended up, they ended up staying in the, the cheapest place they could find, which was a sort of a, a chic recreation of a Bowery flop house. Because you don't rent a room, you bet this like little cabin that you slide yourself into. And so there's, and I had read an article recently, there's also a, um, a, a tapas bar there, not topless, tapas bar, <laughs> which with the name SRO, you know, for single room occupancy. So, so the whole thing is, it's, it's crazy. It's been themified, you know, it's been like, you know, yeah, it become a theme park, the, Bow the Bowery theme park. But anyway, um, at that time it was, it was actually the Bowery and I was walking down the street and there was, it was the middle of winter and there was a big old Cadillac with fins, a convertible with a top down and there was somebody sleeping in there and the snow was falling on him, you know. And I was like, what the, heck? you know. So that, that was something I had never experienced, even in the East Village, which was, you know, a notoriously um, poor area with a lot of, you know, open, mar open door drug bazaars and all that. But all the, you know, all the hundreds of people that would gather in, on Avenue C and Third Street to, to, to buy heroin, they all went home somewhere to use that heroin, you know. It, there just was, weren't lots of people on the street. You know? So all that's changed. And uh, you, that, then what that means is it could change again, right? It doesn't always have to be that way, even though it's been that way ever since you were born, if you were born in the 90s or something. Anyway, uh, yeah, so I started investigating that, and I, and I happened to be in L.A. before the Olympics in 1984, and the, the city was um, busily trying to uh, shine up its image, and, and that meant uh, create, finding creative solutions for the people who were living in Skid Row, LA, which were a lot of people at that time. And uh, so there was talk of opening the internment camps that had been used for Japanese Americans in the desert. Uh, so sort of a, a desert spa vacation. And then there was an, another, another creative idea coming out of the city council, which was a, the QE2 was off. Well, oh, was near. Oh, I thought. <laughs> 
the QE2. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the QE2 is off Long Beach Har in Long Beach Harbor, so th there was also the possibility of a sea cruise. But anything, <laughs> to, anything that would get people out of sight, you know, and uh, that was sort of the deal. And I and so I went to some of these hearings, and I met uh, some a, a group of activists, which included ho homeless people and advocates, and um, and some lawyers. And they, it turned out they were all coming out of the Catholic Worker. Um, which, uh, which was a couple blocks from my house when I lived in New York, and I'd always admired them but, and read all the Dorothy, Dorothy Day's books and stuff, but I'd never actually been there. So now suddenly I, I was hanging out with these guys. I started volunteering for them, and very quickly uh, I, I ended up moving out there and working with them, and just at that moment their, their law clinic had become a full-fledged entity of its own, and I and, uh, and within a hot minute, I, was, I had a job working for legal aid as an outreach paralegal for, for homeless issues. And that meant I got to travel to every, uh, it was a great job, especially in the era when there weren't any cell phones, because I got to travel to every welfare office in, the, in, uh, in Los Angeles County and uh, hang out in the lobby all day and see what people's problems were and help them with their problems. And then also go back and meet with a bunch of lawyers and report on, you know, what the emergent problems were and how, um, you know, how we could sue that via class action, uh, solve that via suing, yeah, with class action lawsuits. And um, so it meant that even though I was wearing a T-shirt, you know, and blue jeans and a sneakers, I could make bureaucrats really jump because it wasn't just that I was going to get somebody the two hundred and twelve dollars a month that they had been refused, but I was going to get thirty thousand people the $212 that they had been refused. So it was big, it was real money. We were talking real money here, you know. And so one of our cases took, took, took us to, we were also in the same, uh, we were looking at uh, people discharged from county hospital, same place Kevin was talking about, uh, in their, you know, you know in, the, in, a, in a hospital robe or something like that. Because there were a lot of, uh, Kevin's looking at the people who are using the services that are, that are not actually supposed to, supposed to be there or something like that. And these were the people who had been prematurely discharged or discharged with nowhere to go. So they just, instead of arranging home housing for the homeless people that, were, that had been patients there, it was just like, okay, you know, here's the bus stop, um, go to the mission, something like that. So, um, uh, yeah, so anyway, that's my, that, but so anyway, out of that, I, for, um, while I was working for the lawyers, I started, uh, we, we decided we'd do a workshop for uh, a, a performance workshop, which seemed um, like an improbable idea. But anyway, uh, because of all the goodwill that, that I traded on in the community that had been built up through the Catholic Worker, through the Law Center, and all the clients that we knew, I just gave these flyers to a couple of clients, and, and they went out, and uh, millions of people showed up, you know, because, and a lot of them had their, you know, their. Screen, it's LA, they had their screenplay that no one had ever read. They had their novel no one had ever read. They had their 12 rap songs no one ever had listened to. And so, uh, you know, and so uh, nobody wanted to listen to anybody else because they wanted to read their novel, they wanted to read their screenplay, they wanted to do their rap, you know. So it was a really chaotic environment, um, and, uh, which, is, which was what was true of the neighborhood at the time. And we sort of embraced that chaos for a couple of reasons. I, one reason was, um, you know, in working with the lawyers on the on the on the lawsuits, um, w my job as the as the not only the evidence gatherer but the um, plaintiff gatherer was to go find you know the white guy with the with the perfect work history, uh, you know to be the lead plaintiff so that he, especially if he played golf so that the judge would you know have a you know identify with the plight of this guy, you know, so um, so, but in in. Uh, in LAPD, I felt we could we we didn't have to do that. We could, in fact, our job was to provide sort of a bigger picture of what the situation was, not just the not just the needle in the haystack, but the entire haystack, you know, and um, so that we could actually represent, it, with the thinking that if you if you're really thinking about solving social problems, you might as well not imagine the problem in the first place. You might as well know what the problem is, and then maybe you have a better chance of coming up with a remedy that would make sense. So. Um, and the other concern, I guess, was also that there were so many catch-22s, not only at the hospital, but everywhere else. You know, if you, if you wanted to get a shelter bed, you had to behave yourself. If you wanted to get a meal, you had to act right. If you wanted to get any kind of social services, you had to act right. 
So that meant the people that were the, you know, the, who really needed the services the most because they couldn't act right, you know, <laughs> couldn't get them, you know. So LAPD became the place where it was all right to not act right because it was important to, to show how people actually do act if we wanted to deal with, you know, anything seriously. Maybe I'll stop there. What a fabulous spot. Act right. The, all right, so what I, what I promised in the beginning we would go to at this point would be your choices of some words. And we're going to make a list here. I've checked in advance. There is chalk. I myself have made a list of about 15 uh, <laughs> that I could happily have this group expound upon. But I'm going to turn to you. And we have runners with microphones um, up in the back coming down. Who has a word that they'd like to suggest for the list? What we're going to do is we're going to, um, we are going to create, a, my thought was create maybe about eight different words, and then I thought we'd turn to the panelists and ask if they would pick something out of that that they'd like to speak to, and then move on from there and see how many we can cover in the next um, hour, or a little less. The word I was thinking of is dependency. Any variety of dependency. You guys can play with that as much as you'd like. New stories. Thanks. International solutions. Uh, the United States, the world, and how people are dealing with similar problems. Abandoned. Isolated. Compassion. Total compassion. Mental health, mental health issues. <laughs> Obamacare. <laughs> can I write ACA? What? Yes, you can. <laughs> All right, let's stop at that point unless anybody has any other burning one they want to add. Not Obamacare. Well, let's leave that as a piece of that. Is, yeah. Can we agree to that, that that's an, that's an option in that category? All right. So what um, I'd like to do um, is, uh, first of all, um, if, so we have, have these kinds of thoughts that have been inspired and the people that have been listening to you. Um, and is there one that one of you would like to start with? I just want to say that when we just came from Minneapolis, and there was a there, they had one of those refrigerator poetry magnet things, you know, and on the refrigerator, and we oh, could. Oh, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> I would have brought it for you, John. You can you can string them together and make you know sentences, but uh -huh. well, anyway, okay. I can start with mental health. Go ahead, Seal. Seal, we'll start with mental health. Let's let's begin there. So I wanted to start with mental health because. Um, in the beginning of the clinic, um, we used to think that we weren't really taking care of anybody with mental health. We said that we weren't really able to take care of people with mental health issues. And um, over time, we realized, um, looking at our numbers, in fact, um, mental health issues came up. I have like some data here, if every, anyone wants to hear about different things, but um, this year, uh, mental health issues was our second highest diagnosis. So. It kind of felt like in the beginning we were sort of missing the boat, like in sort of splitting people up instead of looking at the whole person, I think, in a lot of ways. We're lucky enough to have a psychologist who volunteers at the clinic, and we also have a psychiatrist. We wish we could get some more because the need is there. Um, and what I, ha I have a team, a group up here with me today, 
And so if they have any input on this with me, that would be wonderful. I was told I could ask people to help me if they were here. <laughs> so if anyone has uh, any of my team. <laughs> so it's always a surprise that that one's coming up at, at the top. Because we, we think of ourselves as not really being a provider, but, but we definitely are. Okay. Yeah, I, and I'm a kind of bootstrap on that. Um, I wanted to use, look at the term total compassion, but uh, I'm going to start with. You can get the, to that after. Yeah, the U.S. Department of HUD, Housing and Urban Development, um, has indicated that in Los Angeles, County um, between 2011 and 2013, uh, homelessness increased by 15 percent, up to a total of 57,737. And as John indicated, um, you know, in his lifetime, um, he, he's witnessed where there was virtually no um, homelessness per se. Um, to where now it, it, it's sort of a matter of fact thing. Uh, in Los Angeles in particular, one of the reasons that that came about is during Reagan's reign in California as governor, he actually closed all of the uh, mental health institutions. And, you know, it was, just, it was cloaked in a, a, a softer, gentler form. Well. You know, it will make these community care facilities um, for the homeless. Um, so they'll be closer to their family, you know, we'll be able to mainstream them and integrate them. And then none of that was funded. So that's one of the reasons for the explosion of homelessness in Los Angeles. And so we see that in many respects today um, and what's happening around our big county general hospital. Um, there are people that, there who have physical health and disease, but a lot of it is brought on by their mental illness and by their poverty. You know, and, and it, so it all gets aggravated. And so there's compassion. Uh, and, and I see it in these nurses who are medical professionals, and they're out there, and they're working, and, and, and many of them are ER nurses, but the guy that's been sitting in this seat for the last six months, um, you know, they have compassion for them. And the organization that I work for, after talking to the nurses and hearing them describe how overwhelmed they are, but in a compassionate, caregiving way, we have compassion. And surprisingly, um, not surprisingly, because, you know, the, the larger community, which is a, a primarily Hispanic community, and, and the diversity uh, of the patients, um, it is quite broad in terms of who's utilizing the hospital, um, but the surrounding community has compassion for these people. Um, and the hospital um, administrators, not the caregivers, when you're hands on, you can't help but, you know, the story that you read, you, you, you know? Um, when, when, when you touch people and, and, and you feel their heartbeat, and, and or if you feel their skin cold, you want to give them a jacket. You know, when you see them with the shakes, you want you want to feed them. That's what the community concept does. But the administrators are looking at it black and white, dollars and cents, and they recognize that this is not good for business. So the compassion that comes from one human being helping another um, is what it, it, it is what I aspire to do and be, and this project is trying to incorporate that 
somehow into this business model. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And now they're the ones that are helping us get paid, but we're not selling out. If we're going to sell out to anything, it's going to be to compassion. It's not going to be to anything else. So that word kind of struck me because, you know, as fellow human beings, we are our brothers and our sisters keepers. Do either one of you want to speak to, to those themes any further before we perhaps move on to a different one? Well, I can say a lot about mental health, I guess, in, a different, in many different ways. You know, and um, I mean, like, again, when I was, um, when I, when I, I mean, Ken, Kevin mentioned that there were a lot, well, when I was working for the lawyers, for example, one thing we tried to do is get people SSI, you know, which is, is the disability benefit for people who, uh, who are disabled, whether they be mentally disabled or physically disabled. And, uh, you know, it was virtually, it was, you know, nobody, nobody who has a, a mental illness can walk in and, and apply for SSI and get it. Everyone gets denied. And then you get an appeal. And then you get denied. And then you get a lawyer. And then you have a really good chance of winning. You know, so the whole, you know, it was, but you had to, you had to go through all that in order, in order to win, which meant you had to, you know, you had to somewhere along the line hook up with somebody in some, in some, uh, you know, grassroots organization that could hook you up with the lawyer who, uh, you know, who would get you through there. Now, I think actually where we work on Skid Row, uh, the, the local health clinic, they have a, a, a pal of ours who's an outreach person, and his job is to get people on SSI and to go find people out in the street and, and work them through it, and because they have a good relationship with the with the office, then they yeah they can get those people you know he uh, he can get those people through, but but for the most part you know the um, yeah it was it was a it was a it was a destined to fail it was a, a destined to fail um, sort of deal, and that's the way it was set up, you know, and um, I think a lot of times. Uh, yeah, there are, there are two aspects of that. I guess is one is you need the clout. You know, you need the clout to, to back it up. And then sometimes you also just need this, the, the skills. I mean, I'm not thinking about SSI so much, but I'm thinking about, you know, like making a doctor's appointment or getting your effective care for, for yourself, whether you're at a, you know, no matter what's happening. Sometimes you just need somebody who's, who's an advocate who can, or somebody with the skills who can, like, make it all go forward as opposed to, like, blowing up in your face. Could I elaborate a little? Just Go a second. For it. So, um, one thing I really love about our clinic too is that um, we don't require them to bring mountains of paperwork with them. And in fact, when they call and we screen them just to see, usually my th my questions are, well, um, are, do you have health insurance? No. Are you making much money? No. And then they'll ask me, and I'll make an appointment for them. And then they'll ask me, well, what do I have to bring? And my favorite statement is yourself. <laughs> you know, and you can hear like the relief just over the phone this person has that they're finally not hitting another barrier, you know, another wall to climb over. So I love that. <laughs> I've made it 43 minutes into this conversation without stepping out of the moderator role, um, which this group had some bets, I think, going on about how long <laughs> that would take me. Um, but I, I wanted to affirmed that we see the exact same thing in the Upper Valley. Um, Celis describing it on one level from the point of view of the Haven. I can, um, I can affirm that, that, um, that when the institutions were closed in Vermont and New Hampshire, the mental health institutions, the developmental services institutions, that um, networks of community services began to be developed, but they never came to scale. They never reached the volume of service, never reached the design of service that could meet people where they are. They serve the, the bureaucratic <laughs> structures well, but they are not people-centered or community-centered. Um, Seal's words were patient-centered, um, community-oriented. Um, Kevin Michael talked about relationships. He talked about empowerment. These are not characteristics of the systems that we have here in our states any more than they are characteristics of the Los Angeles system. Um, and that is, 
is very germane to folks that we see who come to the Haven, either to our community case managers, because they have health-related issues and don't have those advocates to help them work through how complicated it is. Think about how organized you have to be when you yourself have had a health issue and you didn't get your needs met exactly the first time you made the first phone call about something. Then what happened? And what happened after that? And what happened after that? And how organized and determined do you need to be to accomplish your goals? And when you are burdened by poverty and you are uncertain about how the rest of today is going to go, much less how tomorrow is going to go, you don't do a very good job with that kind of organization. Yeah. I want to pick up on uh, some of this, uh, both the mental health thing and, and something else, but they, but they both have to do, on, as, as, uh, as somebody mentioned, I think Stephanie mentioned earlier, uh, Henriette in the back and, and myself, we were, here, we were here a couple times last year doing research and meeting with, um, you know, uh, people here that are engaged with uh, all kinds of uh, health issues, and one of them was one of them was Bob Drake, who has you know who's who's done a lot of figured out you know done a lot of community a huge amount over the many many years ever since <coughs> these developments we're talking about took place about um, what to deal you know how do to, how do you do something effective when everything is mis dismantled and and he and uh, in talking with him you know he had he had sort of discovered how to on the ground you know. Uh, develop uh, grassroots networks that sort of solve things that 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 the more elaborate structures that had been not you know that had been taken away uh, you know re replacements that were more you know sort of like what we were talking about yesterday Kevin about 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 guys in prison who come up with all these amazing uh, uh, inventions because they don't have anything so so he was sort of the same sort of social engineer out in the community and so and one example that sticks in my mind was rather than having um, you know, um, uh, what, what are they called? Uh, structured workshops for w where people learn how to get a job. They just, he has, his folks, they just start getting people jobs. You know, yeah. based on like, oh, you like dogs? We're going to find you a job, you know, at the veterinarians and stuff like that. So they cut through a lot of that. Um, and the other, another thing was we, we, we talked with, um, with, with Al Mully, who's here and uh, in the back. And also we went, uh, we hung out at, at, at Health Connect. And um, you know, and there, you know, they have, you know, that's the people are going out with. They have health coaches who are people who, without a medical background, who hang out, you know, who learn, you know, work with the doctors and the nurses, and who hang out with the patients, and they stay with the patients, and they go visit them in the hospital, or they take them to the hospital, or they do all these kinds of things, that um, that make. Uh, I think you know that make it really possible for people to get the kind of healthcare you would want to have, and the kind of human relationships and hugs in the in the in the um, in the process. And a lot of my my mom now, my mom is still alive. Although you know she's she's 91 and a half, she's not uh, doing very well, but she's in um, and she's in the UCLA medical system. And so many times, um, I'm contrasting this with the Health Connect, for example. So many times it's like. Um, oh well, you've got something's going on. Your blood, blood pressure is too high. Your blood pressure is too low. Whatever, um, you've got to come in immediately to the uh, geriatrics uh, department. Of course, your doctor isn't going to be there. She's in the hospital this week. Uh, but but you can meet with one of the other people in the staff, the other other doctors, or you can come into the urgent care facility, which is open later downstairs. So in either case, you go in and they say, who are you and what is your problem? And then uh, a couple hours later, generally what they say is, oh, well, we don't have the equipment to do that. You've got to go over to the ER. And then four hours later at the ER, they say, okay, we're sending you upstairs. And then two days later, they say, okay, you're releasing, getting released. And then three days later, the same thing happens. They say, oh, you've got to come back in. So it's a hugely inefficient uh, situation, you know. Not only is it frustrating and, and it, with horrible wear and tear on the patient, you know, but but it's also like just incredibly inefficient use of, of resources. You know, if somebody could have gone over to my mom, and you know, and um, rather than her having to schlep in the other direction and then go with all, this, you know, somebody that she actually knew or had a relationship with, it would 
you know, cut down on a lot of wear and tear, and I won't go any further than that, I guess. It's a good piece of the story. You know, a couple of other terms were, um, were put up here. Someone mentioned early on dependency. And, um, and I can think of that word dependency in at least three different meanings in the context of the conversation we have had. One is dependency on substances, and that's been an issue here in this community um, in relation to the fact that the majority of <coughs> the, the drugs um, that are being used, um, abused, being used incorrectly here, are, are medications prescribed to somebody else. They're prescriptions. Um, we have such a condition here that the governor of Vermont last week spent 30 minutes of a state of the state address talking about heroin and Suboxone. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. yeah. I read about that. Yeah. And, the, um, and then dependency um, is showing up in another stream here. and It was alluded to in um, disability um, benefits, being able to be, um, receive a government benefit because you're disabled. Um, we're seeing that in a conflictual way um, in that um, when people can't find work and their health has deteriorated because their, their living conditions are so poor, then they turn to disability as a new kind of governmental dependency. So there's a second use of the word. And, the, and then the third use that I think about is all of us need to depend on each other in some sort of way <clears throat> to be able to function successfully. Um, and so I would ask if you would speak to any of those definitions of dependency. I um, sort of have a different version. Go for I, it. Um, worked with a um, director the early on who worked in the Peace Corps for like more than 20 years. And her, her um, quote that I've never forgot to this day, and I think about it all the time when I'm taking care of patients, is never create a system where people are worse off when you leave. Mm -hmm. So we really try to think about that when we're talking to people on the phone. We try, you know, we want to walk with them the walk, but we want them to know how to get what they need because, I mean, maybe someday we won't be here, you know, mm -hmm. so I always like that philosophy. What came to my mind is, you know, hospitals and healthcare, you know, they're dependent on us, the people. Now, on the other hand, <laughs> uh, one of the lines we used to have in our performance was, or, or that we were considering putting, is how, you know, you, you don't wake up one morning say, hey, I think I'll just mosey on down to the emergency room, you know what I mean? We all are dependent on this huge healthcare system. And unless you're of a certain income, um, you know, it's not awfully responsive. You, you know what I mean? There, there's hoops that, so it's not very many, um, institutions that just have a, um, you know, a built-in constituency, right? Mm -hmm. But. You have to earn the business. Except for healthcare. You, you, you know, everybody here knows someplace we, where the hospital is. Or you dial 911 and add to the bill, the meter is running and good the hospital, the ambulance comes and gets you. Um, but they don't respond in that way. And um, so there's something inverted. You know, um, I went to law school. And what was weird about it was in the first years, they shook real, real hard when they might have been more caring and kept more people in. They say, look to the left, look to the right. God is behind you, ain't gonna be here next year, right? Then you get to your third year and they had a little box and if you check that box, meaning you're a graduating senior, you're damn near guaranteed to get a passing mark. 
when it seemed like the further you went, the more expertise and <laughs> the higher the standard it, it, it should have been. And um, it seems to me that the needier the health need, um, that it should be the same type of thing, you know? But it's not that way. It's kind of inverted in that manner. Other comments you would make about this theme? We still have the ACA, Obamacare, or non-Obamacare, and international unreactive. Yeah, I just have a, a question about the dependency and sort of linking to what Kevin uh, was saying. And Can you speak on my connected to Obamacare. Can you speak English? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and I was just wondering if you guys maybe uh, can ad address that because when uh, uh, I think what Kevin was also saying, when we were creating the performance, um, it was very difficult for us to sort of bridge the huge gap between uh, caring and, uh, and compassion and, and people being sick and then, uh, you know, insurance. Uh, the pharmaceutical industry, uh, hospital charges, the big charge master. So the whole business side of, uh, of, of health care, right? On the one hand, we all say health care. It's a very nice word, as if people care. Um, we need care. Uh, we are all uh, scared. We are all depending on it because we are scared of being sick. We are scared of dying, ultimately. That's maybe even the ultimate uh, fear. And it's very easy to prey upon that and to say, well, you know, you, if you want the best care, you better pay for it. And of course I want the best care, right? And, and so in creating this performance, uh, we've been thinking a lot about, about that, that gap between, uh, and the link, the bridge between those two uh, sides of the coin, really. Um, you know, and, and I hear things coming back uh, with Obamacare, you know, people saying, why should it be mandatory for everybody to pay into that? I am healthy, why should I care, uh, you know, about for somebody who is not healthy, you know, I, 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 I don't want to pay all that money. So, you know, the basic discussion is happening there as well. So I was just wondering if anybody could speak to that. Well, I think I think the kind of separation that happens when when uh, when one side, you know, and this uh, this is also it happens in the arts sometimes, especially um, you know where where one side where you where one you know some people are charged with being compassionate and some people are charged with coming down with a hammer, you know uh, that that or you know or being the being the some people are the money people and the other people are just the artists, for example, which is a model that doesn't happen in our theater, because, but it does happen in uh, other places. And, uh, and it's definitely the Dutch model. I know when I started working over there, um, you know, it, it, we talked to the artistic director. I mean, this is 20 years ago when I started working over there. And then, and then you, you talk about what you're going to do and, you, and all this and says, great, okay, now go talk to this other person. That's the money person. So there's, this, there's a, sort of this like, um, you know, one person became, remains totally pure and the other person, if, if there's any dirty work to be done, that person does the dirty work, you know? So this is sort of the situation you're describing with care also. The, 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 you know, and I think, I think it's, it's, very, it's very weird. I had this, actually this did end up in the show in a, in a way. I had this experience where, um, where a doctor of mine uh, really tried to, in my opinion, um, you know, do an end run around the insurance company by asking me to pay the deductible up front to him, and, um, and before he did it, before he did an outpatient surgery for me, and um, and I, I, re, I, did, I refused to do it, you know, but um, but uh, it was like. Um, then, then, but what happened? He didn't ask me that. Of course, he had his he had his business person ask me that, you know. And then when I, but he, when I said no, they were still they still did the procedure. But then on a follow up appointment after the surgery, um, his when I went in, his business person wasn't there. So I said to him, you know, you know what what was that? Why did you do that? And then, it, it, he was like, blah, 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 well, blah, blah, you know. I mean, you know it. You know, and he was totally unprepared for somebody to actually talk to him about this. And yet, of course, the idea came from him in the first place. Mm. So uh, th that did make the show. Yeah. 
Um, but anyway, I think that kind of disconnect, you know, is, is, is not healthy uh, and it's very uh, crazy making for, for uh, the, the person who has to receive, you know, receive that kind of, be in that kind of place. In our planning conversation um, prior to this panel, uh, we had reached a point where we were talking in quasi-revolutionary terms. Um, and part of the... Part and of if you want to hear that conversation, the NSA, you can go to the NSA for that. <laughs> because it was on the phone. The, uh, um, on a Dartmouth phone, no less. The... Uh, <laughs> And in the same way that John alluded, I'm, I'm sort of doing a preamble, I'm framing it as a question ultimately to the three of you. John alluded to 1983 as a time when there was change and it had to do with drugs in the streets and drugs in the communities um, at a tipping point that changed what the nature of communities was. But there was a time when health care and health care delivery and relationships between providers and patients were different than they are now. And that was still within the recollection of some of us also. And, and that's not where we're at now. And so the sort of revolutionary discussion and question that we got to was, is it possible to think about change coming from the community to impact and influence institutions and structures when we look at something like um, the ACA, when you look at the question, <coughs> the, the international word that someone threw out and what are things like in other places, what is the balance between um, the, the, the government, the financial industry, um, the individual as consumer, um, how do these pieces fit together and where <coughs> does power reside <coughs> and where can change um, emerge. I, I think um, in looking at the, I mean, one one reason we you know we're doing this project with uh, with a Dutch company, and one reason uh, we did that or the, or the, was that in the Netherlands there they used to have a, the 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 government used to run the health uh, pro policies. They used to provide po you know policies. Now it's all privatized uh, insurance. All, they have something similar to actually Obamacare in the sense that it's, you're mandated, you have to buy health insurance, you have to buy it through a private company. And um, so that, that's pretty much what we, what we have now. The two big differences there are one is long-term care is included in, in the insurance. And uh, that ha that's been proposed here in the past, it has never happened. And, uh, and, the, uh, and the other thing is that the government still puts a cap on what hospitals can charge for things, and that's not included uh, in here, right? So, um, um, I don't know why I brought that up, but it seemed, I forget what the it's other half of my thought was. I forget what the second half of my thought was. Oh yeah, so, so that was, uh, um, well yeah, I'm losing my train of thought, so go ahead. About, about change and how, whether, where, where can power be and change come from? Yeah. I guess, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know what the end of that thought was really at all, That's except that, except that I think, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't. Well, I, I think um, the fact that the insurer still has so much, one of our cast members, um, we were rehearsing in the Netherlands, um, had a condition that was very serious. Um, and so she went home to get this matter taken care of, right? Um, but there are so many layers of um, referrals and checks and double checks um, that she still hasn't had. The one thing everybody agreed upon, surgery is necessary, but from August of 2013 to January 14th of 2014, right? Um, that surgery has not been conducted. Um, and there are a lot of built-in barriers to that, but it 
it's all of these who and, and I guess I think I said earlier that you know it's hard work being poor because for one thing there's this unequal dialogue you know I'm telling you you know when people start talking to me in that tone I have a tendency to disregard them and on the other hand, because you're on high, you know, you're a doctor, which is next to God, right? You're not hearing me. You know, um, I got a big mouth and a stubborn streak, and I was born left-handed. So I'm going to make sure you hear me. <laughs> but very often, um, for people as poor as me, you know, we have another defensive mechanism. I'm, one voice is saying to you, yeah, 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 and the other voice is saying, as soon as I get out of here, I'm going to do just, you know? And so the communication, um, the economic and status disparities um, create, cre create a, 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 a situation where the communications because ultimately, like I said, everybody knows, the expert <laughs> and the patient, this surgery needs to get done. But some priest was looking, well, how do we get paid, and how do we do this, and when, you know, and then, um, gee, we better do this test so the lawyers don't get involved. And all these other things, what about the patient? I think so, there's a lot of hallucination, though, that goes on as to what really happens in these circumstances. It's not, it's not just, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, it's, I, think, I think there's a lot of, I think people come to a situation with a lot of, with a lot of baggage of their own that, that they then project onto somebody else that doesn't really solve anything. So, um, but, but anyway, let's get back to the question at hand, you know, which is, which is uh, about what can communities do to change things? Well, that was the question. Well, can communities do something to change things? And might fit into the question about new stories. What are the new stories? I think. I think. I mean, I, like I was thinking about the. You know, I think. I think. Uh, I think. Yeah, the, the communities can do things to change things, and I think, you know, little initi You know, initiatives like. Experiments like like um, Dartmouth Connect, which was not started by the community, it was started by a, a, an entrepreneur actually. But I mean, it's a, it's a different story, it's a different model, it's a, it, and it and it does bring things closer to the ground, and it does insert community into the the equation. And the things, obviously, the things you guys are doing, and obviously, I mean, I was thinking like my just with regard to my the the thing I was telling about my mom l earlier, you could easily start, you could probably start a network, and there probably are such networks of people, you know, they just get together and say, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna make sure everyone, you know, gets to their appointments or something like that, you know, just simple things like that, that you could do as a, as a network, as a volunteer network. And I'm sure people have started things like that. Actually, and, here in the Upper Valley, there are a number of communities that, particularly for elders, are, taking actions in this kind of way. There are the aging in place networks. Um, you know, there's, um, Maria's here, I know that you're working on one in Heartland. I know they're working on one in Stratford in Vermont. Uh, they're working on something in Lyme, New Hampshire. Many communities in the area um, are, are beginning to take small steps around that particular yeah. kind of theme. Yeah. But I think what's crucial, like, I mean, in, with, regard to, with regard to the small steps like that, I think it's ultimately. I think it's really important to link to link your own on the ground efforts to to the you know to sort of the uh, the the policy issues that are around you know so that so that for example when I when I brought up my first half of a thought that I couldn't finish about the um, about the differences between the the Netherlands system and here I mean you know the the fact that there isn't any cap on hospital uh, what hospitals can charge in. In the Affordable Care Act, it just means that there's something else that we would like to see happen. I personally would like to see happen in the future that would rationalize the system more, and that and needs to, and we need to go there. And I think if, I think it's important to link up the like on the ground stuff that that has clear, you know, clear uh, 
you know, that isn't just organi you know, political organizing, but is, but is sort of, you know, has a sort of community caregiving aspect, but also to link that up with what, what are the, pol you know, the bigger policies that, that should, be, uh, should be advocated for by those same groups and by others to, in order to, in order to you know, bring the whole thing down to something that is more uh, a, res a, f a fulfillment of a, com of a community kind of system. I kind of got a question to throw out broadly, maybe somebody in the audience or on the panel. But um, should health care be a right? We treat it as a privilege. And because it is a privilege, you know, it's, it's tiered. But should it be a right? The microphone is coming down. We'd love to hear some comments on that. I think probably all of us feel that it should All of us feel, I would hope, that it should be a right and not just a privilege for the, for the people that can afford Sorry. And not just a, a privilege for the people that have more income. And, um, and that's why some of us here help out in the community. And, and help seal with her project and in other ways in the community or, or help our neighbors too. How about the young people? Any of the young people in here have any thoughts about that? Come on. <laughs> How about you? I agree that healthcare is a right. Access to quality Yeah, that's all. Sure. So I think what you were saying before about inverting the system, uh, I think that really targets your question. Uh, fundamentally, the, the, the process of healthcare, giving it, receiving it, isn't really a good, uh, but it's treated like one in the U.S., and in fact, it's, it's, a little, it's a little scary to think that there are other countries, Canada for one, uh, the UK, for, uh, UK's not a country, but you get my point. They're privatizing. So it's this, this issue, um, I think, touches, touches more than just the, the idea of we deserve it because it's something that can't be bought or sold. It's a fundamental belief that all of us deserve to be healthy if we can be, and if we have the expertise to share that, why not? Um, I, I reverse that and send it back to you and say, so if, it's not, if, it's, if we're not gonna think about it as a, a, as, a, um, as a product, as something that can be bought and sold, then what then is it? <coughs> what is this thing? Here we go. Behind you. C. Everett Koop was here for quite a while and lent his wisdom to lots of different things. And I recall him talking one time about, uh, I think it was during when the Reagan administration, uh, no, when the Clinton administration was trying to put in a universal health care, talking about health care needing to be affordable, accessible, and excellent. You know, that's what everybody wanted, the best the most affordable and the most accessible. And he said, pick two. No, basically, uh, you can't have all three. I think it's a little bit about like the 1%. There are some people who want absolutely, absolutely the best for me and are not willing to spread it across everybody a right. I, I would agree with my wife that it is a right. And we in this country just haven't you know, st stood up to that principle, we really select people really want to have, have it for them and they're willing to sacrifice other people uh, because of that. And that's, that's unfortunate. We just need to have some sort of a movement to change that. Oh, Molly has a question. Al and, and Sarah, maybe Sarah and then Al. Um, we talked earlier about the disconnect between the compassionate and people-oriented side of healthcare and the business side, and I think that's also mirrored in 
people's reactions to healthcare delivery right now at, within kind of their own perspective um, in that Kaiser Health News did interviews of individuals' reactions to the Affordable Care Act and it, across the board they found that a high percentage of people agreed ideologically with the idea of providing healthcare to all and healthcare being a right. And yet, even among those same people, they were struggling with the realities of that and the financials of it. And the idea of kind of sacrifice and real total compassion versus kind of theoretical compassion. And I think that's kind of an interesting reality to compare to the system and what's actually happening. And then Al in the back. The, 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 uh, just a, a, a comment on what the role of the community and individuals in the community might be. Um, th there's a long history uh, in global health about uh, conversations regarding health care as a right or um, health as a right, um, even in very low resource settings. And there are lots of phrases that have evolved over time um, saying that governments have a responsibility to um, the progressive realization of health care as a right, recognizing that there may not be the resources available in a particular setting to do everything for everybody. But my favorite articulation around this was in uh, 1978 um, uh, at something called um, the uh, Alma Ada, a place called Alma Ada in Kazakhstan. And, and the, the expression was that um, healthcare is a basic human right, but it'll never be realized unless and until people are engaged individually and collectively in the design and implementation of their healthcare. Now, the, the, the reason that's so important is that um, communities and individuals, particularly <laughs> individuals when they're gathered together collectively in communities, um, take such a passive view as to what is right for them in healthcare. You know, we, we sort of sense that science tells us what the right thing is, that the surgery is needed, to use your phrase. Um, and um, most people think that roughly 10% of what could be realized in terms of health prospects are due to health care, as opposed to lots of other things, genes for sure, but, but also um, the community you live in and um, uh, the social determinants is the phrase that's usually used, um, childhood education, um, agency, being able to make good decisions, avoiding violence and all of that. So uh, too often I think we get caught up thinking that we want a right to health care when in fact um, we overestimate how much healthcare per se contributes to our health prospects. And, and that's the kind of engagement that um, Sarah and I and others in, in the Upper Valley have been talking about a good bit. Until we do that engagement, we will repeatedly fall short of meeting people's basic needs because they're defined outside the realm of healthcare. Yeah. Um, while we will exceed their wants if they were well informed, within what is included in the definition of healthcare. So it's a, the, I, I think we want to focus on what we mean by a right to health care as opposed to a right to health and its progressive realization at the individual and the community level. Um, but I've been talking too long and would really appreciate hearing some reactions and learn from them. Um, I basically agree with everything that's been said. Like, I don't think that healthcare should be determined by income at all, but I also like, just want to remind everyone that with rights, I think, should come responsibility, just like with all of our rights. So I think that that should apply with the right of healthcare. I left that out. That was said in um, uh, right and responsibility to be engaged individually and collectively. Others like to join in or have additional comments on this or other questions that they'd like to ask in these last few minutes that we have. I just wanted to address the issue of efficiencies also in healthcare and in delivery. Uh, I mean, there seems to be the perception that throwing more money at this issue is how we're gonna solve the problem without looking at the inherent efficiencies that we've created in all these years that we've practiced healthcare. Like, like what, for example? I mean, I mean, I work in primary care, and I look at how much of the primary care, we have a shortage of primary care physicians, and how much of the primary care physicians' work could be replaced by other professionals. 
who are cheaper and would be more available. And, uh, and it also the perception of the patient that every time you need somebody that you want to see a primary care physician where he, may not, he or she may not be the right person to serve your needs. Yeah. It has to come both from our perception, also changing perception of patients of what is needed versus efficiencies in the system. I wonder how that. I wonder if how that squares with <coughs> what I was saying about my mom uh, earlier. Whether I'm just uh, you know asking irrational things, but it, because when then I go to the we take her to the urgent care center and the people say who are, you know what's your name and what do you want, and then I you know maybe I mean maybe it's more I, maybe I'm you know maybe you're talking about me because you know the, from my side it seems like well, you know if I have to go explain who my mom is and what she wants then you know we're starting from like really from zero as opposed to somebody who knows what's going on or they going on with her but you might you might be saying that well this is much more efficient than going to i mean or maybe you're not but I, it seems like there's a big maybe i'm the culprit you're talking about i don't know The real health care is we do the real health care and we don't have we do everything we we don't have any records and I think I, I think there's a perception that having records or electronic records or anything that is computerized is against what real health care is and I and the realization is that there is a lot that can be done using automated uh, systems both in terms of recording what it is I mean you instead of having to repeat what you want to every individual that you meet along the continuum of care that could be recorded at one instant and shared across you know the crazy thing is they seem to record everything but no one actually reads what gets recorded <laughs> <laughs> well and that's the thing perception about efficiency changing and we've been we've been used to and reimbursed in a way that doesn't really promote efficiencies until some of those incentives change. Um, I, I think we're all beating our head against the wall. And I'm going to challenge you at this moment to maybe take those two pieces and blend them together. In my magical world of what if, I go back to the fact that every one of us, last time I checked, got born with a body. And, <laughs> the, and, and we could make the choice to be responsible for that body but then being responsible involves having access to the information and the knowledge about how to be a good steward of our own form. And I have to say personally, that's one of the most frustrating things for me when I think I have a simple question. I'm thinking, I wonder what this means or what this is or what to expect next or whatever. Um, I think, well, how do I get that information? And my choices right now seem to be, you ha I have to make an appointment with somebody who is overqualified for the level of question that I have, or I find WebMD, um, or somebody's chat room, neither which, one of which I totally feel comfortable relying on. Whereas if there were a navigator, or a coach, or a community place where I could get information and that others could get information they needed, which might be different information than mine. What would we have here in the community if we had that kind of resource about bodies? Um, and what then would we do about our consumption of health care if we knew some different things about being healthy? And if there were a health advisor for your mother who could maybe sort out that mess that was going on and would listen the first time um, so it didn't become second, third, and fourth time to get the answer to the first question, which is really what happens. Um, what would it be like? Is that what access is? When you talk about you want access, is, are you picturing you want to be able to get to your doctor when you want to, or does my version of access play into your, what would, would meet some of your needs? And again, it's what are your needs? Up behind. Well, in fact, I think we do have in this community several resources. We have the Women's Health Resource Center, which is a 
center for people to get information about a variety of topics. We have the Center for Aging Resource Center, which provides groups for couples or individuals who are struggling with a particular issue. They have Parkinson's disease groups. They have geriatric groups. They have Alzheimer's support groups. We have, I mean, if you look at a page of what's available in the, in the Valley News, you see a wide range of community resources offered by the medical center, offered by APD, offered by, the problem is the very people who need those resources the most have no way to access them or don't understand what's available or don't know that they're there. And so when you're talking- Or have no transportation and no at transportation. the times that they meet. Right. When you're talking about implementing change at the community level, the model has to somehow include reaching those very people whose needs could best be met by all the resource points that we do have. And what I, I, I do, I'm diabetic, type two diabetic, and I do a peer-to-peer -peer diabetes group in the local clinic. And I would say that there are maybe, let's say a thousand individuals um, who are living in the three big missions that are within three blocks of this clinic. And, and in fact, the, the, the um, CEO of the biggest mission is himself a diabetic. However, if you look at the menus, and I've been trying to engage with them, if you look at the menus, um, of the food that's being served at these missions, we're probably a good 25% of the people, and that's a conservative estimate, our diabetics is filled with starches <laughs> and all of the things that a diabetic should not be able to eat. But because I'm coming from the ground floor, right, and I'm not a medical professional, but the medical professionals all agree with me. You know, if we could get the missions, each one to take four months out of the year to serve a, a diabetic-friendly menu, it would help so much. But we can't get that, you know, so there has to be coordination. There has to be, again, the communication. Um, and obviously a desire. So the problem is clear, but there's still that lack of response because you know this is the way we've done it from the beginning. As um, a young person um, in his, I think it was about 26 years old, came to the clinic about two years ago. He had just come off his parents' um, insurance at that age group he usually does. Um, and he had been out of, he was a type one diabetic, and he had been out of his insulin for days, going on a week. And his girlfriend happened to hear about us and had him call and make an appointment. And he came to the clinic and um, I was tr kind of pulling stuff together like a glucometer so he could test and test strips because we make sure everyone has what they need to live a healthier life, getting insulin for him. And he looked me straight in the eye and he said, what would have happened to me? Would I have died? And I just started crying, and he started crying, and it's like, how, how can we do this to our kids? You know what I mean? How come the system is really cha challenged so that people don't have access? What would have happened to him if he didn't find us? He'd end up in the emergency room probably, and who knows where, where from there. So he stayed with us for a few years, and then he got a job, um, a job that had insurance, and it had a happy ending. But, <laughs> all right. But we have stories like that all day long, all day strong. And you this, guys too, huh? And at this point, I'm saying we're at our wrap-up point. I think that we've come to this place where we are talking about personal responsibility and community empowerment. And I would ask if there are any, just any parting comments, any of the three of you would like to make. I think you've made a good, strong one. See, oh, and John and Kevin Michael, either one of you like to wrap? John's a director. I'm okay. I'm okay. 
You're okay. Yeah, we got work to do. And okay. together, we can make a difference. That's the whole thing. You know, if we percolate these type of conversations and, 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 and hear the thoughts of others, you know, um, we can, if we decide to, make the type of change that will make a difference. Thank you for coming and spending time with us today.